So good morning, everyone. I hope that you are enjoying the conference and also that you attended the networking dinner yesterday and you had fun. Uh, so I'm really happy to see all of you here. Uh, this is a really nice session and a wonderful session about patient and public involvement in research. And we have wonderful speakers here. And my name is Soraya and I'm project officer at Alzheimer Europe. Um, the first person who uh, I would like to introduce you is Sarah Griffiths. Uh, she's a senior research fellow at University College London, interested in primary care-led post-diagnostic support for people with dementia and their care. So, Sarah, the floor is yours, and have fun. Can you hear me, everyone? Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'd like to just start by saying that the co-authors of um, this presentation are also the lived experience group that I'm going to be talking about. Um, so co-production is where public contributors work in equal partnership with researchers, with the principles being power sharing, joint ownership of decisions, valuing individuals' unique skills, reciprocity, or everyone should get something from it, and also building relationships. In terms of um, equality, diversity, and, and inclusion, in the UK, public contributors has, have largely come from white middle-class populations. Um, so it's really essential that participation is widened if research is going to meaningfully address inequalities in care. And published work on um, co-production in dementia research is largely focused on developing interventions or data analysis or reflecting on experience. And a much, much less has been written about the experiences and practicalities of co-producing a dementia research funding application. So this presentation reflects on doing that with a diverse lived experience group. Okay, so I received a career development award to set up a lived experience group, and I started with a very broad research idea to develop primary care workforce communication skills training for delivering personalized dementia care planning. And I put out calls on social media and through national dementia organizations. And the result was a group of six people uh, one person with dementia, four carers, one former carer, two of whom were experiencing visual difficulties. Ethnicities were Asian, British, white, Irish, Scottish, English, and mixed, South Asian and black. And members came from various regions of the UK. So we met eight times virtually, roughly monthly according to the uh, funding timeline. Um, we tried to include one in-person meeting, it was really important to us, but very sadly it didn't happen due to practical reasons. Um, with the aim of power sharing within the group, two co-leads, so um, a South Asian carer and a person with dementia, worked really closely with me to plan and facilitate the meetings. And we used strategies to support inclusion of, of everyone, um, such as those listed here. The content of the group was planned kind of as we went along, not all in advance. And really unexpectedly, an opportunity to submit a stage one outline application came much earlier than we expected. But even after one meeting, we found that the question itself had been refined enough for me to submit that outline application. And you can see that we had some really important discussions that informed the ongoing development of the application. And one really useful thing was that the group gave me a mock interview ahead of an interview with the funding panel, which was actually really scary, and they were quite brutal, more brutal than my colleagues, uh, but in a good way, because it led to a successful outcome with the, with the funding um, panel. So I actually got the funding, spoiler alert. Um, and together we wrote and submitted um, a reflective journal article based on our experiences as the whole process. So we reflected on various aspects of the group. Members really valued the diversity within the group, in particular the involvement and co-leads, which they felt was really inclusive and democratic. Having a person of color as co-lead was a signal that representation was going to be taken seriously. And members loved the fact that they were involved in creating something almost from scratch. Um, normally, we are just quotes on a paper. We all felt that 
having virtual meetings increased inclusivity in lots of ways in that we heard stories of care um, from people from different geographical regions and members with disabilities or health issues who may not otherwise have been able to come in person. However, um, all of the group found the university systems for remuneration really complicated and inaccessible really to people with dementia and carers. And they valued support from a researcher to claim and chase up their expenses, but it still left them feeling undervalued and not really like an equal partner in the research. Some studies take a long time to pay you. When you're properly paid in a timely fashion, you feel valued. But members really loved the fact that they actually came up with the name and the acronym for the proposed project themselves. Nothing really to do with me. CAPT, Communication Aspects of Personalised Care Planning in Dementia. And they felt that that was a sign of true co-production. We all felt that we gained personally from the experience as well, especially in terms of mutual learning, which our person with dementia described as catnip to the brain. Um, and we all felt that we developed new knowledge, whether that was in terms of understanding research processes or thinking about personalized care planning. And the co-leads in particular felt that they developed new skills in leadership and mentoring. And some of us reported that it had reawakened parts of the self and feeling valued for the first time in a long time. As a carer, you can lose your sense of self. This reminded me of my former qualification as an occupational therapist. It makes me feel good about myself. My experience is valuable and is recognized by the group. And for some, this opened the door to other opportunities to do co-production work with other researchers. And for some, uh, people built on the relationships um, that had formed through the group. And these turned into long-lasting supportive friendships and collaborations. So I'm hoping that Martin is going to be talking now about his experience of being in the group. It was the first time I think that I saw that we were actually getting, being asked to help create the question and not just come in when the question had already been asked and been funded to do that particular question. Yeah. I found it very interesting and hard, interesting and hard work, but I call hard work catnip to my brain because it keeps my brain active which is obviously important to someone with dementia. And the conversations were free-flowing and open. We, we, we got on all well together. And I was that interested and felt welcome and equal that I'm helping with the actual research itself. So um, the two co-leads are, co co are going to be mentors on the um, funded piece of research starting from January. Um, we also reflected on the challenges. Um, the virtual nature of meetings came with the usual drawbacks of feeling a lot less natural for conversational turn taking and demonstrating empathy with each other. And we all had to admit that we found our discussions about equality, diversity, inclusion quite challenging and, and difficult um, with everybody kind of wanting to speak at once and it becoming quite emotive, um, partly because people's experiences of marginalization are so individual and emotive and rooted in sort of past wrongs. Um, but uh, sometimes it felt like a competition about which marginalized communities should be represented most in the proposed research. So we've had ideas for how to um, facilitate this a lot better in the future, perhaps by starting with introducing current knowledge on EDI and dementia research and being a bit more directive in the facilitation to make sure that everybody has an equal voice. Having said that, we heard some really illuminating stories which informed the EDI strategy for the proposed research. One member told us about how he'd supported a relative in care planning conversations with a healthcare professional. The relative was a devout Muslim woman. When she requested support with meeting her spiritual needs, the professional responded there was nothing that could be done about that and rolled her eyes. We talked about what an alternative personalized response might look like, what you might actually say. Let me try and understand more. Let's work out how we can make that happen. 
So for researchers, it doesn't matter if your initial idea is vague, it's better in a way. Come with an open mind and be prepared to be challenged. Um, I was really disappointed that I wasn't able to attract more people with dementia or people from other underrepresented groups within dementia, such as people from the LGBTQ plus community. Um, but this is something that I can try and remedy in the funded research. And I think some of the group, well, all of the group really, learned that people with dementia can be role models and advocates, so it kind of challenges and extends beyond this binary na narrative of people with dementia as either tragedy or living well with dementia. And that's learning that all of the group will take forward into their future co-production work. And final slide, final thoughts. Um, for this, if you want to do this sort of co-production work, it's really important to cost in time for relationship building, which is really key to co-production. Um, our research culture really needs to be kinder and more focused on building relationships. As a group, we sort of asked ourselves often, did we do co-production? Um, after all, I did lead on many elements of it and actually wrote the application. But we agreed that we came together um, to create something new through our combined talents. So I had some research skills. Um, someone else um, was really good on policy. Someone else was really good on detail. Um, the rest of the group had lived experience to bring. So one member described this as a critical mass. Um, and Warren et al. here gives some food for thought by suggesting that ideally co-production should be about ensuring that everyone can take part in the elements they choose to and that support and training is provided for any elements that might require that. And finally, universities should have accessible, streamlined and flexible systems for remuneration, um, including options for payments that aren't monetary so that people who claim uh, state benefits aren't disadvantaged in terms of their benefits being capped. Um, and this will help to contribute to increased diversity and equality of opportunity in co-produced dementia research, which can only be a good thing. Um, so that's that. Um, I'd like to say thank you to my funders, my Career Development Award supervisors, Nathan, Greta, and Mike. And here's my details if you'd like to get in touch and find out more. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Sarah. So I, I would like to leave uh, all the questions for the end of the presentation, so all of you have the time to, uh, to present and to say what you need to, uh, uh, to say. And then please write your comments and your, uh, your questions down so we, uh, we can address all of that uh, in the end. So thanks a lot, Sarah, again. So our next speaker is uh, Meg Wyatt. Uh, Meg is a research associate based at the Geller Institute of Aging and Memory, University of West London. Her interests uh, lie in how arts, particularly painting, can provide meaningful uh, routes of expression and engagement for people living with dementia. She's currently working as a co-applicant of an N NIHR funded project exploring the use of everyday restrictive practices for people living with dementia with acute settings. Um, the floor is yours. Meg, welcome. Hi, everybody. Um, it's really nice to talk to you um, today. So the, what I'll be talking to you about is using art to support patient and public involvement for people living with dementia. So just to begin with, a little bit about me and my background. So I work as a research associate at the Geller Institute of Aging and Memory at the University of West London. Um, my background is the arts, so I'm an artist, um, and I'm interested in how the arts, particularly painting, <laughs> Um, can be used to support patient and public involvement work for people living with dementia. Ooh. Yeah, so just a little bit about the project that I'm currently working on. Um, so I'm a co-applicant. It's National Institute of Health Research funded. And what we're aiming to do is to understand the everyday uses of restrictive practices in the care of people living with dementia. Um, and the idea is that through gaining these understandings, we'll be able to um, reduce inappropriate use, identify good practice, and also look at what alternative approaches can be. So why, why is this important? So um, 
At the minute, people living with dementia are one of the largest populations within hospitals, and within this, a high proportion are emergency admissions. In addition to that, people living with dementia are the patient group who are most likely to be restrained, and this is likely to happen earlier in their hospital admission compared with other patient populations. So restraint um, can include things like physical restraint, uh, containment, seclusion, and I'll talk a bit more about that as this presentation goes on. Um, it's a really, um, it's a big study, it's an ethnographic study, um, but the, the strand that I lead is patient and public involvement, so I'll, I'll talk to you about this aspect of it. Um, so what are our aims in regards to patient and public involvement? So we work with different patient and public involvement groups um, across the study, but what I want to talk today about is how we use arts um, within some of these groups and kind of the effects and impact that that has um, and some of the things that we're finding out through this approach. So with regards to our, our work, we want to capture a diverse range of perspectives relating to restraint. So what does restraint mean to different people living with dementia? Um, what are people's experiences? What do they want to happen? Um, we also um, want to ensure that we are inclusive um, and this be, includes being inclusive of underrepresented groups and then adapting projects um, accordingly. So over the past 12 months um, we've delivered 13 group and individual arts workshops across a range of different settings around the UK. Um, just before I move on to the next slide, all the, the, all the pictures which are in the following slides are all created by people living with dementia during these arts workshops. So it'll give you a bit of an idea about the types of artwork that's, that's being created. So how do we develop appropriate projects? Now this is a huge area um, and you know I don't have time to, to talk to you about everything that we do, but what I wanted to do is to just give two examples of two different projects and how we have adapted them um, to meet the needs and wishes of, of different people. So um, one project that I've developed is um, working with people living with dementia who live within very remote areas um, of Wales. And something that uh, became apparent was that they wanted to be involved in, in the patient and public involvement work but actually what was really important to them was that they had the opportunity to socially interact, um, you know, go to a shop, things that, you know, you may take for granted, but for them, you know, you talk to people and they might have not seen another person for a week because their house is, you know, on the side of a mountain and, and they don't get that opportunity. So with that in mind, we developed the Patient and Public Involvement Project at an established arts centre that has a cafe, a shop, a gallery space. We would time the sessions, so we'd run hours in the morning if we knew that there was then another, another event being run by the gallery in the afternoon. So people had these opportunities to engage on top of what we were doing. Um, another project that I've been working on is um, working with a daycare centre which provides culturally specific care for people living with dementia from an African um, and Caribbean background and something that is really important to them is they want their voice to be heard um, and they want that to have an impact so we've run numerous arts workshops there and what we're talking about now is how can we use that artwork that they've created to spread a wider message so we're looking at things like developing a catalogue developing um, an exhibition, developing training um, resources, looking at the arts work. So hopefully that will give you a bit of an idea sort of about the different types of things that we do. So the approach to the arts workshop. So as I said, the projects are all different, but actually how the arts workshops are ran um, is similar and, and the approach is something that is really important. Um, so within, within these arts workshops, everybody is supported to paint something which is personal to them. So there may be um, a, 
a predefined theme. Sometimes people want that. So, for example, a couple of weeks ago, I ran one which was based on freedom. But people don't have to adhere to that if they don't want to. Um, and this way of working is developed from my own PhD research, um, but also the work of Sean McNiff. And the idea is that if you support these individual styles to emerge through creating artwork, um, it, it sort of you, you find out more about people over time and, and that way of working develops. Also, something that's important is the researchers who are delivering the art workshops, so I'm one of them. We are both artists and we have a good understanding of the materials that are being used. So, for example, sometimes I will sit and paint alongside somebody rather than trying to verbally communicate. And that creates a different type of communication and interaction than you would get if you were just sitting and talking. Um, I think just something that's also important to note with regards to that is for people who may find verbal communication difficult, um, this way of working is much more inclusive and people still have a form of expression and communication, um, even if, it, if it's hard to verbally communicate. Um, so you, you can capture a wider um, range of views and experiences. Um, sometimes we have group and individual discussions um, around creating these art workshops and sometimes we don't, it depends what people want. So, findings, what have we found out? So, through doing these workshops, in relation to restraint, what we're finding out is that um, restraint is all different, you know, perceptions of restraint are all different for different people and they often relate to the much wider context of people's lives. Um, so, for example, somebody might not be able to go to a dance class anymore that they've been to for the last 40 years. And for them, that feels like a huge restriction. So these experiences are happening before people are being admitted to hospital. And then when they are admitted to hospital, if they are, it's then massively exacerbated. In relation to hospital care and restraint, um, what we've been finding is there's the maybe more obvious types of restraint, which I, I gave examples um, at the beginning, but actually there's much more subtle ones as well. So, um, for example, being placed in a room where there's no window, not being able to easily reach the buzzer, um, bed rails being used, you know, lots of different more subtle things. Um, in relation to culturally specific care, um, individuals feel that this often is not provided and things like language barriers, um, lack of culturally appropriate food, assumptions made by professionals, these all cause huge feelings of restraint. So how, how, is, how does the painting fit within this? Um, so sometimes people will directly express an experience or a thought relating to restraint within their painting. So this painting was created by a man living with dementia and this was an expression of his experience of being physically restrained in hospital. And he used colours, um, the action of applying the paint, different forms to directly express um, this experience and from that we, we got a, sort of an understanding of what that felt like for him um, and what happened. On the other hand, people um, sometimes paint things which are much more abstract. Um, sometimes it has nothing to do with restraint and actually what we find is that that creates a balance within these sessions. So although we might be looking at experiences of restraint and that can be very difficult to talk about or to think about, um, having this kind of alternative route of engagement provides a balance. Um, on the other hand, sometimes, you know, they're abstract representations of restraint. I think what we're um, finding as well is the actual process of painting and how people um, living with dementia within these groups engage in the painting is coming up with some really interesting insights. Um, so, for example, 
the process of painting can encompass feelings of uncertainty and certainty you know we all do it we can doodle when we're on the phone you can paint a green wavy line and you don't need to know why that is but it's still a form of expression you know and um, we're finding it can engage with alternate modes of cognition it, it provides non-verbal decision making um, you know lots of things and through understanding what is happening in this creative process for people living with dementia they, these insights can then be used to inform wider PPI work. So that's all from me. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Meg. Wonderful presentation. So our next speakers, we have two. And Anna Smith and Michael Booth. I won't say anything else because they want to use as much as time they uh, they can of their presentation. So welcome both and enjoy. Yeah. Hi everybody. I'm Anna Smith. I'm the head of involvement at Alzheimer's Society, and I'm co-presenting with Michael Booth. Do you want to have a, a rest for a little bit longer? <laughs> okay. Oh. So, Alzheimer's Society have a long history of patient and public involvement in our research program to start with. So, I just sort of break down what the difference between participation, involvement, and engagement is, because all of them are important. But in principle, participation is where people are recruited to a study. So, they're not necessarily changing it. it is all about extracting the data from what it is they're doing or telling you or uh, providing. Involvement is where the research studies are carried out in partnership. So people affected by dementia in this case are able to make changes to that research. So they'll identify the priorities, potentially changing what those priorities are right at the beginning. So patient and public involvement starting as early as you possibly can is best because you're going on that journey with people affected by dementia. So yeah, identifying priorities, questions, designing the research. The key there is, can it be changed? And if so, will it be? Engagement is sharing information about the study. So sharing information, knowledge about the research, either during or after. And the best kind of engagement is when you involve somebody affected by dementia in creating the presentation or the literature or whatever it is that you're doing and obviously co-presenting, which is why Michael's here with me. So yes, research that is carried out with or by people affected by dementia or, and relevant experiences. So we were hearing before that and, and in other uh, presentations. If a study is looking at a community of people, then people affected by dementia who are also from that community, either LGBTQ plus or ethnicities, uh, makes it a more meaningful experience for everybody. And it's done with, rather than to, about, or for them. So yes, we've said identifying research priorities, being equal members of project steering groups, co-producing or uh, co-designing research materials, um, undertaking interviews with research participants, because often people will speak more comfortably to someone else who has that shared experience. So a case study that I want to talk about was uh, run by the UK Dementia Research Institute. So I provide um, advice to uh, researchers, either whether they're funded by Alzheimer's Society or not, and we uh, were founding funders of the UK Dementia Research Institute. One of the researchers is working on a deep brain stimulation, um, non-invasive deep brain stimulation project, which involves wearing a headset. So we worked out together uh, who we could ask. So I work with Michael and about 380 other research network volunteers through Alzheimer's Society, and 18 people affected by dementia came forward. So that is affected by uh, dementia as a diagnosis or a carer. I'm not sure if we had any former carers on that group. We didn't. But their <laughs> experiences are legitimate as well. Um, and why? It's to develop 
the brain simulation technology, the headset, is what they really wanted to help with. And that takes time to actually have a conversation with the researcher to really, or with yourself, to really understand what it is that you're wanting to make it a meaningful uh, interaction and relationship. And the impact of the involvement, it was a number of workshops, both online and in person, a lot of conversations around the prototype and the, the purpose of this, this headgear. Um, and it changed the design of the headset through the conversations, through the uh, interactions that were, were done really sensitively and over a period of time so that people had the opportunity to think about it and come back with questions. The um, people with lived experience said, would we be able to use this at home? Would we be able to change it according to our hairstyles? We had a, a couple of people with rather large hairstyles. And the researchers hadn't thought about this whatsoever. And they changed it. And that's key to co-production and, and involvement. If the changes can be made and are made, then you've got a good, a good project on your hands. So I'm going to hand over to Michael now. You can talk about this. You can talk about your experience of being in the research network. I'm not going to tell you what to talk about. <laughs> over to you. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, everybody. Are you well? Yep. Oh, very good. You didn't put them to sleep, at least. So that's all right. They're still awake. Very good. It's nice to see you all here today. A little bit about myself. My experience with dementia started about 14 years ago. Um, my mom was diagnosed with young onset dementia uh, about four years ago. Sadly, the disease took her life. Just a few months after that, I was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. How do you tell your dad, who's just buried his mom, uh, just buried his wife, the love of his life for 50 years, that now his son has the very same disease? That's not the only thing that was heartbreaking. At that point, it was like somebody just turned off a switch. I couldn't work. I wasn't allowed to work. My license was taken away from me. Friends who I thought were friends, disappeared. It was literally a black hole that we seemed to have fell into. And that's when I got in contact with the Research Society. In fact, they contacted me, the Alzheimer's Society, and asked if I would like to be part of the participation groups. Thought about it for a while because at that point I wasn't sure what I could handle. You know, everybody's been telling me that I can't do anything. And suddenly I thought, well, let's give it a try. And to my surprise, well, I can. <laughs> and it's been so enjoyable to work with you as researchers on projects such as this, right from the very beginning. Why do we want to have people with lived experience working with you as researchers? I mean, you may be asking that question. If, for example, you work with brain samples, you're doing, working in labs on mice. Why would you have people involved? The answer to that simply is we can help steer and guide your research. And that's all we're here for. Can I go to the next slide? Which button do I push? There we go. That could be why it's green. So what is it really? Well, Anna's, Anna's touched on that, but what we really want to point out is that very first word in bold, meaningful involvement. Through the Alzheimer's Society, we get to see a lot of grant applications. And quite a few of them in the past would just say, all we're going to do is disseminate information. That's not really involvement. Involvement is working together, allowing us to steer and guide. Why? why? Why do we want to do that? Try and picture this. You may not have to picture it very hard. What's it like if somebody tries to finish your sentences? What is it like if somebody makes decisions for you? You go to a restaurant, that person, while you're busy sitting there, says, would you like chips with your steak or whatever? Sorry if you're vegetarian or vegan. 
Would you like, and, and the person sat next to you says, no, he'll have vegetables. That's what it's like for a researcher if you don't include people living with dementia. Will we take over your project? No. I'll give you another illustration. You decide you're going to go on holiday. Uh, while we're in Finland, we're going to go up north of Finland, I suppose up towards Sweden's border. We won't go too close to Russia. So we go up towards Sweden's border, and, but we don't quite know where we're going to go. We know it's up north somewhere. What would you do before you go on your journey? You perhaps consult your, whoops, perhaps I can't see it, you've got a black thing here. Consult your map. You might want to check, do we need to stop anywhere? How much fuel will I need? Will I need food along the way? There are certain things that you would ask questions about. So in this case, as a researcher, that would be your concept. As soon as you have your concept, engage people, ask people the lived experience, preferably those living with dementia, what do you think this will work? How can we go about it? So now you plan your journey, and you get your funding if your application goes through. So now if we go back to our experience or our illustration, you get in your car, you now start your journey. But before you start your journey, what do you do? You punch in the postcode or wherever it is that you're going to go into your navigation device and you follow its direction. That voice, those directions, that is the involvement and engagement. And that's all we really want to do. We don't want to take over your project. We may challenge your project. We may ask questions as to why you want to do things certain ways, but we're simply there to ask the question and guide you and steer you. It's really your choice whether you want to use that information or not. Just like it's our choice whether we want to get involved in your project or your research. But I think you're going to find that if you are open-minded, if you're able to take in what we're saying, you will need a little bit of patience. And unfortunately, you're going to have to jump through some ethical groups with regards to your institutions and universities. We're trying to work on that to make that a little bit smoother. But in the meantime, you're going to have to do that. But if you work with us, we can help make your project, your research, meaningful. We can make real progress. We've already made lots of progress when it comes to dementia. We understand far more about it than we ever did. But there's still so many questions. Well, what happens, though, if your project or the research that you're working on doesn't give you the answers that you're looking for? That can be off-putting, can't it? Then you, what do you do for your next one? Am I going to get funded? It can knock your confidence a little bit. Again, go back to people with lived experience. Why? Well, first of all, we can motivate you. We can try, gear you on, let's go, come on. When the fight is not won yet, we've got to keep going. And you're the researchers that are going to provide the answers. The second point that we really want to try and bring home is that at this moment in time, in, in early stages of research, not getting the answer that you were looking for in itself is an answer because now it can help us and you as researchers steer in a different direction. So it didn't work. Where do we go from here? Bring back the people that you were working with, that you have a close relationship with, because you will get to know these people as friends. They will come to know you, as I have many of you sat in this room I've done work with. And it's quite nice to be able to see and hear how your projects are going on. Relay that information back. Let us know how things are going. Let us know how we can help you, steer you, and guide you. Right from the very beginning, right through to the end. And if we do that, then we, we can make real progress 
when it comes to dementia and the effects that it has on people. Five minutes left. Well, that's okay. Got plenty of time. <laughs> Will it change anything? Yes. Because like we said, even if your project doesn't produce the results that you're looking for, or it's only year one of your project, of a five-year project that seems to take forever, your mentor's on your back trying to get you to do things, you're getting frustrated because you're running out of time, you know, the staff, that, yes, keep going. It will make a difference in the future. I will ask, and I know this is something that a lot of people trying to do at the moment, but collaborate, talk to each other. A lot of projects come through are the same projects that we've already seen, the same grant research we've already done. We want to move in different directions. You can do that if you speak to people. If you speak to those of us who are diagnosed, we generally have the pulse, on, finger on the pulse of things that are going on, and we can try and help you, guide you, steer you, and not in this fight alone. And let us try and help you to as we go along. I don't think I have anything else to say. <laughs> Thank you, and keep going. There is one thing I would like to say. I nearly forgot, and it's so nice today. You see, dementia, I've got an excuse. I'm here at the moment with my lovely wife, Aileen. She's at the back there recording in the pink. Say hello. <laughs> she, we are here at the moment celebrating our 30th year of our wedding anniversary. And she is my rock. Without her, this disease would be so much more difficult. So, thank you. Oh. <laughs> and just, we just wanted to say thank you, sorry. No, to, no, no, so obviously, thank you to Michael. Thanks. Now I'm all cheery. Thank you, Aileen. <laughs> um, and the designer, Sophie Horrocks from the Helix Centre, the DRI, Matthew Harrison also from the uh, Helix, and Nia Grossman is the uh, researcher in charge of the, the project that we're talking about. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Wonderful and powerful presentation. And uh, love is beautiful, isn't it? Okay, so next speaker, Nora Narsaka. Uh, is a doctoral researcher in the field of nursing science. Her dissertation focuses on older adults' physical activity and mobility in institutional long-term care. She's doing participatory research with older adults, their family members, and staff members to co-develop environmental solutions to increase older adults' activity and improve their mobility. Nora, the floor is yours. Enjoy. Hi, all. Petri and I, on behalf of the rest of our international writing team, We'll share our thoughts about co-authoring as means for discussing the rights of people living with young onset dementia. Involving people living with dementia in research to make their voices, needs and rights heard can take many forms and can be done in many different ways, as we have seen from the earlier presentations here and throughout the conference. Mm, these include also co-authoring, where an individual with lived experience of dementia is part of the research and writing team, which is something we have done. Our writing team consists of Petri, who has been diagnosed with dementia whilst of working age, and altogether six academic researchers from Finland, Sweden, and Canada. One key starting point for our collaboration was that the rights of people living with dementia have been at the heart of our research projects. Um, and Petri and his wife have been members of our Finnish steering group, and therefore we knew that Petri has knowledge of these rights and, and has personally, personally had to fight for them. So together we wanted to capture Petri's personal story of navigating the system to find different kinds of resources, such as health and social services, 
to live a good life with dementia. And this cooperation has been carried out as part of two interrelated research projects exploring um, working age people's experiences of mild cognitive impairment or dementia, as well as a project um, concerning safeguarding welfare, among others, for people living with dementia um, in times of pandemics, a project in which I currently work. At the beginning of our co-writing project, uh, Petri and Anna, whose disciplinary background is in law, and I with a background in social psychology, um, discussed um, initial topics and how to proceed with the writing process. Then Petri sent a story he wrote for this purpose, as well as several speeches he had given in Finnish or in English while working as an advocate for people living with dementia. Then Anna and I analyzed the data and drafted first version of the paper. And then Petri and other co-authors uh, read it and uh, we discuss, uh, discussed about it and made amendments and based on everyone's ideas and so on and so on. Throughout the preparation of the paper, we have tried to maintain open discussion and listen to Petri's views on both on the content of the text and the writing process. We have discussed, for example, whether the best way for Petri to contribute would be by meeting and discussing the paper or uh, by commenting writing comments to the draft itself uh, by email, and whether he wanted to read the paper in English or in Finnish, or could or should the text be made easier to read in some other way. Remaining sensitive to Petra's personal story is important for us, um, starting with the challenges he faced in getting a diagnosis and accessing adequate services through to advocating for people living with dementia to, to defend their rights. So we focused on identifying not only the problems and obstacles he has faced, but also the various things that have helped him to claim his rights and live well, uh, ranging from the support and help from others to his own perseverance courage, skills, and activity. Making choices is an essential, essential part of research and writing it open, so many important things need to be left out. Petra's previous experience in making such choices and uh, um, uh, making amendments to texts uh, has supported our collaboration as well. But still keeping Petri informed of the choices um, and changes made to the text has been really important. And um, maintaining his opportunity to either agree or disagree with them and continue accordingly. And so far we have not yet had an opportunity to make changes requested by peer reviewers, but in the future it will no doubt be um, important to maintain this uh, working method or practice and also trust between us as well. Thereby do it by doing like that. Research process including analysis writing and um, finding the right journal and making revisions and doing it, doing it all again is, uh, until the paper is finally published can take some time, as we know. And this is the kind of challenge with co-authoring that you need to try to manage somehow and at the same time tolerate in being in a kind of in-between state when it comes to things that you can't really influence that much. 
but now it's Petre's turn to share his thoughts. Olin hyvin iloinen saadessani kyselyn, että haluanko osallistua yhteiskirjoittamiseen Itä-Suomen yliopiston hyvinvointioikeuden tutkijoiden kanssa. Olin jo aikaisemmin tehnyt mielenkiintoista ja mielestäni hyvin tärkeää ja luottamuksellista yhteistyötä heidän kanssaan. Minulla ja heillä on sama ymmärrys, että tuomalla asioita sekä kokemuksia esille voimme vaikuttaa asioiden laadun parantamiseen. He tuovat asioita esille tutkijoina ja minä taas sen omien kokemuksieni kautta. Olen muutama vuoden toiminut Alzheimer European Urban Working Group of People with Dementia työryhmän jäsenenä, joten olin jo tottunut aikaisemmin osallistumaan moniin projekteihin ja tekemään yhteistyötä monien tutkijoiden kanssa. Tiesin ja tunsin, että he toivovat yhteiskirjoittamisen myötä saavansa tietoa minun kokemuksieni kautta. He eivät odottaneet minulta asioita, joita en osaisi heille ilmaista. Yhteiskirjoittamisen osalta yhteydenpito tutkijoihin toimi oikein hyvin. Minä kun olen impulsiivinen mies, niin minulle kävisi ehkä hieman nopeampikin toiminta. Kokonaisuus toimi mielestäni oikein hyvin. Ja olen tyytyväinen, miten kokemukseni on tuotu tutkimuksessa esiin. Kirjoitus on minun näköiseni ja toivottavasti se herättää keskustelua teissä kuulijoissa. Tekstiä lukiessani ihmettelin taas kerran, että miten olen jaksanut käydä tuon kaiken läpi. Suurimmaksi haasteeksi totesin mielessäni englannin kielitaitoni, mutta osaan hyvin käyttää hyväkseni tekoälyä ja sen kautta tulleita käännössovelluksia. Vuosien ajan olenkin niitä käyttänyt. Tämän toiminnan kautta kielitaitonikin on myös mukavasti kehittynyt. Rohkeudella sekä aktiivisuudella olen toiminut monissa asioissa, kuten myös tämän yhteiskirjoituksen suhteen. Haluan vaikuttaa asioiden eteen, enkä jäädä niitä itse miettimään. Lisäksi tämä kirjoittaminen ja muukin aktiivinen työskentely tekee hyvää toimintakykyni ylläpitämiseksi. Etiikka on tullut minulle vuosien varrella tutuksi. Tiesin tämän työryhmän ja aikaisemmin saadun kokemustoiminta koulutuksen myötä, että miten kertoa osaavasti ja rakentavasti kokemuistani asioista. En halua aiheuttaa mielipahaa asiantuntijoille tai virkailijoille. Ei ole heidän vikansa, jos rakenteet eivät toimi. Usein nämä ovat poliittisia päätöksiä ja myös vamma- vammaispalvelulakiin kirjoitettuja. Valitettavasti meitä muistisairaita ei kohdella tässä laissa tasavertaisesti. Kognitiivisia hankaluuksia tai vaikeuksia arkielämässä ei mielestäni ymmärretä tarpeeksi riittävästi. Olen tämän asian havainnut oman kokemukseni kautta työikäisenä muistisairaana. Olemme myös joutuneet vaimoni kanssa tekemään paljon työtä saatavien palveluidemme eteen. Emmekä ole valitettavasti ainoat henkilöt, jotka ovat joutuneet tekemään työtä oikeuksensa toteutumisen suhteen. Toivon, että tulevaisuudessa nämä asiat toimisivat paremmin. Iloa tuottaa, että pääsen jakamaan kokemukseni teille yhteiskirjoittamisen osalta. Kiitos. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thanks, guys. Uh, we have time for questions. We have mm, more than five minutes, so I hope that you have. Uh, I have the microphone here, so please raise your hand if you uh, want to ask anything else to these uh, fabulous researchers and also uh, all uh, these people, Michael and, and Petri, that shared uh, their experiences uh, working, uh, living uh, with dementia. So if you have any questions. Yeah, just a very short one for the last uh, presenters. Thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, has your paper already been published? And if yes, where can I find it? Um, not yet. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I'll stay. Just stay tuned. Thanks. Anything Hi, uh, thank you for the interesting talks, uh, all very in inspiring. I think everyone here wants to get started 
on to this uh, with involving people uh, with lived experience. Um, but as a junior researcher, do you have any tips on how to start with this, how to gather people? Um, because I would really like to do it. But uh, yeah, any tips, challenges are welcome from any of the speakers. I think that's a super important question. I wanted to ask that as well, so thanks. <laughs> I don't know if you want to start. Yeah. Uh, well, obviously I work for Alzheimer's Society, so I would recommend any uh, charities who engage with people affected by dementia, approach them. They should have um, an involvement team, which I do, um, and if they don't, um, local groups. So residential care, if that's what you're, depends on what you're researching, but community groups are a really good place to start. Have you got any ideas of how to engage with people, those? Anyone else? Over here. Thank you. Um, mine's a follow-up to that question of, do you know of like funding pots that support involving people? Because we've we've talked a lot about the kind of PPI side, which often comes before a research application, that involvement to develop the research application. But there doesn't seem to be many pots that help to um, make sure that people with lived experience can be fairly compensated for that work, which then potentially already starts you at an imbalanced relationship because you're essentially asking them to volunteer that time. Um, so have, are there any thoughts about how we can go about funding that better? Thank you, Rosie. Um, I think there are some small pots of money, and I know that in England, for instance, the NIHR are starting to sort of offer what I benefited from, which was a d specific Dementia Career Development Award, but um, also like various fellowships as well, um, because I think it's gradually becoming recognised that researchers want to work um, on an idea at the very early stages of conception. Um, but yeah, I think probably just like that will improve as time goes by, as awareness increases. Yeah. I, I will... Uh... I don't know who, who am I speaking to? Uh, hello. Um, I just want to, want to say that a lot of people living with dementia, I mean, Jerry will say the same thing here, is when you're looking at concept and you want to include from concept, most of us will do it voluntarily because you're, you're, you're looking at a concept, you're looking to go forward. A lot of projects, a lot of research, we don't get paid for, at least in the UK anyway. Um, and, and we don't really do it for the money. We do it to try and help the next person who's going to be diagnosed. So yes, it's nice to get some because most of the times we're living on one salary or some benefits from the government if they're giving it, but it's not the be all and end all. What we're really looking at is the research. You have inspired me to talk to the grants team, though, because I think a little pot of money for... <laughs> yeah, just to give you the confidence to actually go about it, because to, to ask for someone to do it for free, although you're willing, it feels more respectful, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. No, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Stuart from Stand. Fife in Scotland. It's a question and more an observation for Megan, the, the artist. We at Stand are great believers in the power of the arts. We've had painting things of the past. We have now embarked on music. The difference from what I can see is we have people with dementia and their carers doing the lyrics and a professional musician puts it to music. Um, what do you feel about that? Do you think your thing would translate very well to doing that sort of thing? Yeah. It's all arts. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, just thank you, really. And it'd be good to talk to you a bit more about that, maybe after the session or whenever you're free. <laughs> some point, some point. <laughs> oh. 
Um, hi, everyone. I'm Tanya from the Amsterdam UMC. I have a question for you, Sarah, specifically. Uh, if I understood correctly, your group consisted of one person with dementia as well as carers. How did you go about that and weighing the input of everyone? For instance, if they um, gave different answers, how did you weigh that? And did you weigh the answer uh, or the input of the person with dementia differently than the input of the carers? Or yeah, how to navigate that? I think one thing that we all agreed at the beginning was that the person with dementia had a priority voice in the group sessions. Um, and the person with dementia agreed with that as well. <laughs> and we all kind of, as a group, made sure of that. Um, it, it, it seemed to work really, really well. I was more worried that people wouldn't have enough to say, um, but people had a lot to contribute, and I was kind of nervous going into this, thinking, well, the conversations are just going to wildly go everywhere, and how is this going to help with the application? But after every single meeting, I feel like we'd heard from everybody, and it did really help to focus um, the writing of the discussion. The only thing that was quite difficult was that a couple of people didn't like to switch their cameras on in the Zoom meeting, um, and they had their reasons for that, which everybody understood, but our person with dementia felt that it was challenging for him to not see people. And after we did the reflections, and everybody knew that that was his reflection, one of the people put her camera on, and we saw her for the first time, which was lovely. <laughs> Uh, okay. Oof. I have so many questions over there. <laughs> I have one, but I will do that just to, before closing the, uh, the session. Thank you. Um, hello, my name's Laura Cole. Um, I'm from the UK University of West London, Gal Institute of Ageing and Memory. And I was just picking up on your points, really, about payment and things like that. So just to sort of um, let people know that we do have um, a young onset dementia group. We did present it in um, one of the sem seminars. So if anyone wants to, it's existing. They do, at the moment, literally, at the moment, there, there is no payment. But the point is that we are looking at sustainability. So people will get paid through that and have done up to, up to um, very recently. And we're looking for more money for that. So if you are interested in initial, initially speaking to people with dementia and you don't have money, then you can come to, well, you can come to speak to me. Um, and I would be happy to put you in contact with um, our groups. That's wonderful. Thanks a lot for that info. Uh, I, okay. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Alzheimer Slovenia Association. I would like just to add that it's very sad that people with dementia has to fight for their own rights and that the system can't support can't, uh, based on volunteers, but it has to be solved from the side of the state. That is what we have to do, to do in Europe, everywhere, in all countries. We, uh, we face with this finan fin financial problem everywhere. So thank you. So I think that it's time to close the session, but I will do, I will, I would like to ask the, the last one. I think that for all of you, uh, and some of you mentioned that it's really important to build relationships between the researcher and uh, between the person with dementia you are working with. Uh, how do you do that? What's your advice for people that want to uh, start doing public involvement? How do you do that? Because I think that maybe, at least for me, my experience is something really important and something that sometimes is a little bit difficult to, to manage. I don't know if... Trust takes time, so you factor in the time and make your uh, meetings as accessible as possible. And even if it seems like a, a really obvious question to ask, but ask what works for the people that you're involving. You know, perhaps they prefer to be online, perhaps there's hybrid situations, a better idea. Food, refreshments and travel are key. If you can help with any of those or provide, absolutely, absolutely. What do you think? Yeah. I also think... Um, cake. Yeah, cake. <laughs> I cake. Just take a little bit of time before the session. Don't always make it all about the research. Have a little bit of a chat, how they're doing, how you're doing, allow everybody to speak. 
you get to know each other. You become friends eventually as time goes on through the project, because most of your projects are three to five years. So you're looking at a length of time that you'll be with those people. And you'll see, especially those with dementia, how they progress. And so you'll get to know and understand what they need and times. Be patient. Wonderful <laughs> advice. I think uh, so I can uh, finish the session. Just one final thing in terms of building relationships. I found it really important to, with working with a group, it's really important to meet individually with every member of the group, which I did before starting the group, and that helped to um, set in motion the relationship building and reassure, reassure people that the person doing the group was someone that they might actually like. <laughs> Thanks a lot. It's been uh, ah, very okay. Just the last minute because we have to go for a break. Okay. <laughs> it will be quick. Okay. Right. Is this on? Is this on? Right. As as part of a co-production group that Rosie was involved in as well, uh, what I'd like to add is social time. All right. Every meeting that we started started with a little bit about what have you been doing? What have you been up to? whether it was just very silly informal stuff or not, and we had sweeties. And I have to say, you know, to this day, we still talk about it as the sweetie group, you know, and, and those sorts of little touches and bringing the social aspect to it so you build trust, you get to know everybody, more than just as a researcher and, and someone in the group, you get to know them as friends, and that was crucial. Perfect. Thanks, Barry. Well, now, yes, we have, to, we have to close the session. I thank again to all the speakers and also to uh, all of you for attending. I hope you uh, will enjoy the rest of the conference and see you in uh, Geneva next year.